Last year, the number of people in Europe infected with measles was the highest in a decade, three times the previous year. Of those infected, well over half were hospitalized and 72 died. We've had an effective vaccine for decades now, so why are we losing people to this disease? In the UK and around the world, immunization rates are dropping year on year because online misinformation is fueling fears about vaccine safety. According to the World Health Organization, vaccine hesitancy, so the reluctance or refusal to vaccinate, is now a major threat to global health. This is just one example where falsehoods spread online are having real-world consequences. There are plenty more. In 2016, a man became so convinced that politicians were running a child trafficking ring from a pizzeria in Washington, D.C., he walked in with an assault rifle and opened fire. A recent YouGov poll in the States showed that 16% of adults have doubts about whether the Earth is round. For 18 to 24s, this rises to one in three. I'm sure you're aware of other examples. I spent the first 15 years of my career working in the media and communications, including some of the UK's biggest youth media brands. By the time my two boys started going online to play and to learn, I had a growing and unsettling awareness of the enormous influence that digital media would have on how they see and engage with the world. I wanted my kids to be prepared, but instead of wrapping them in cotton wool, I wanted to give them the skills they needed to navigate the internet well. So I co-founded the Digital Life Skills Company to teach young people how to make sense of the information at their fingertips, because we as adults aren't currently equipping them with those skills. Only 2% of 9 to 16s have the critical literacy skills to tell if a news story is real or fake. And two in three teachers believe that fake news is harming students' well-being by raising their anxiety levels and skewing their worldview. Why aren't we doing more about this? And why is there so much misinformation online? Well, there are two main issues. The first is a problem with the technology. Let's call it the platform problem. The technology behind the big platforms like Google, Facebook, and YouTube is designed to engage us as much as possible so that we consume more ads and they make more money. So it prioritizes what's popular and engaging over, say, what's accurate. The interactions don't have to be positive either. Love it or hate it, whatever gets the most clicks, views, comments, and shares gets prioritized. Whether it's makeup tutorials or Holocaust denials, there's no such thing as bad engagement. So what does get the most clicks, views, comments, and shares? Various studies tell us it's material that is fear-inducing, divisive, sensationalist, or provokes a strong emotional response. This isn't new. The press have tapped into this stuff for decades. Fear sells. Shock sells. Which leads us to the second related problem, the people problem. A major study found that on Twitter, falsehood spread six times faster and reached significantly more people than truths. That's staggering. And this virality is driven by us, by our human appetite for novelty. Falsehoods they found are 70% more likely to get shared, which isn't so very surprising. In a world where we're overloaded with information, falsehoods get the upper hand. After all, it's far easier to be interesting when you aren't constrained by facts. And more engagement means there's money to be made from fabricated stories like a YouTube video that says you can charge your phone in the microwave. <laughs> in Macedonia, where youth unemployment is a whopping 55%, the easy money to be made from manufacturing news stories has become an industry. One teacher said she almost doubled her salary. She said, I know it's wrong to take a side job which consists of saying vaccines kill or the Holocaust did not exist or promoting Trump, but when one's hungry, one doesn't have the luxury to think about democratic progress. Others create stories around issues known to push buttons, like gun control, immigration, Brexit. Sometimes for polit political reasons, sometimes for humor. The internet is awash with spoofs, parody, and satire, sometimes so convincing that we miss the joke. Some satire features disclaimers, such as this one. But still, people believe and share the hoaxes. 
Others deliberately remove such disclaimers or copy the stories to make money from the clicks. Even refuting the lies can feed the system, as some extremist groups are learning. One white supremacist website revealed its strategy of claiming that Taylor Swift was a secret Nazi. The media covered the sensational story, which was then shared by fans defending their idol and critics justifying their dislike of her. By joining in, both sides unknowingly help normalize an extreme ideology. So why do we fall for this? Well, we're human. And there are three human traits which are fueling the spread of misinformation. One, identity signaling. When we share, we're often saying something about ourselves. Take this story. Carly was frustrated because her mother repeatedly shared fake news on Facebook. Each time, Carly would send her mother news articles or links to fact-checking sites refuting the claims, but her mother persisted. Eventually, fed up with her daughter's efforts, Carly's mum yelled, I don't care if it's false. I care that I hate Hillary Clinton, and I want everyone to know that. If we're honest, we're all a bit like Carly's mum. When we share, we're often showing who or what we believe in, or trying to coax others around to our way of thinking, even if the content is dubious. Two, the reiteration effect. We're more likely to believe things that we see or hear repeated. This is a real problem online, especially as users copy, edit, and rehash digital content. It feels as if things are coming from multiple sources. Donald Trump didn't say this, by the way. And now there's a wide array of amplification tools, such as Likeabots and software that runs armies of fake social media accounts. The more we see something, the more credible it seems. This YouTube comment sums it up. There are two million Flat Earth videos on YouTube. It can't be BS. The more time we spend on the platforms, the more exposure we get to the sensational content they promote. Some of the staff employed to moderate social media posts have to sift through so much conspiracy material that they start to believe the content they're meant to be moderating. Three, herd mentality. We humans have been relying on each other's cooperation and expertise ever since we formed tribes. And we trust information that comes from people we know or like. Why research which washing machine to buy or who to vote for when trusted friends have all the answers? So if a friend shares something, we're more likely to believe it. Say I trust Emma, and she posts incorrectly about an actor being a tax dodger. I'm more likely to believe it. I then share my view with my good friend Jeff, so now he believes it too. With the three of us sharing the same groundless belief, we're all more convinced we're right. When dozens, hundreds, or thousands of others share the same belief, how could we possibly be wrong? Our herd mentality also means we're more likely to believe someone who has many followers. Being part of the pack used to mean our survival, so we track our actions and beliefs against others and adjust them to fit in. So if a friend likes a post, we're three to four times more likely to like it ourselves. So the platforms keep serving us the kind of content we've engaged with before, repeatedly reinforcing our existing beliefs. Plus, we see similar content shared by people we know and like. And that can leave us feeling a bit like this. Is anyone questioning their own habits yet? That's good. Acceptance is the first step. With that in mind, raise your hand if you've ever shared an article or a video online. Keep your hand raised if you've ever shared an article or video without clicking the link first or without reading it all the way to the very end. Let me tell you, you're not alone. Sensationalist news, fabricated stories, Propaganda, none of this is new. But what is new is how pervasive it's become. Because of the platform's hunger for our attention and because of the opportunities for anyone with a smartphone to make money and influence opinion. But we can do better. So what can we do? One, slow down. Much of our faulty thinking can be stopped in its tracks if we take a moment to stop 
and think. After all, what's the rush? It's not as if we're ever going to finish reading the internet. Read the story to the end. A Columbia University study found that six in ten Twitter links got retweeted without users even clicking the link first. Check the story matches the headline; that it hasn't been exaggerated or taken out of context. If something's worth sharing, it's worth reading first. Consider the source. Fight the tendency to trust something just because it comes via someone that we like, or because lots of people are talking about it. Find out where it originated from, and be skeptical if you can't find a, a credible source. Notice when our emotions are being targeted. Misleading content isn't always factually incorrect. Sometimes it's about provoking an emotional response or painting a biased picture. Our critical defences are low when we feel angry, afraid, or upset. So ask yourself: Am I being played? Make active media choices. We should seek out and support, with our attention and with our clicks, comments, and shares, the sources that are genuinely trying to get to the truth of the matter. Report, don't share unacceptable content. The tech companies need to do much, much more to stem the flow of false, hateful, and harmful content online. We need to tell them about it instead of spreading our outrage. At the beginning, I asked, "Why aren't we doing more to teach young people how to deal with online misinformation?" Well, the truth is, we didn't grow up with the internet, and we are no less susceptible to its tricks than our kids. Every day, you, me, Carly's mum, we all shape the digital landscape. Our clicks and comments influencing what we and others will see tomorrow. Right now, we're lazy. We rely on what shows up in our feeds or at the top of search pages. We share things we haven't read properly, and we trust others who make the same mistakes. We all need to improve our digital information literacy to protect ourselves and prepare the next generation for what lies ahead. We can't separate the world into truth and lies, but we can show more awareness. Awareness of the technology that knows us better than we know ourselves. Awareness of the tools that manipulate our beliefs. Awareness of our own fallibility. And question both the content we see and our own behaviours. We are not powerless. We are now the media. We should embrace our power to change the digital landscape and choose to make it better. On April Fool's Day last month, one of my friends shared this: "Ah, first of April, the only day of the year that people critically evaluate things they find on the internet before accepting them as true." We could all do worse than treating every day as if it were April Fool's Day. Thank you.